I want to try to see if we can finish Dodwell today and leave the remaining three lectures to focus on Hume. So I'm going to go back over some of the territory that we only briefly touched on last time and go into it in a bit more detail. At the end, I'll bring it back around to Hume, and that will be our point of contact for moving forward into a fuller discussion of David Hume's essay of miracles and the responses that were written to it which is a very important point of culmination for this course. So I've entitled this lecture, Dodwell and His Critics. I'm going to quote very largely from Dodwell, and sometimes the quotations may seem tedious, but they're there for a reason. You'll remember that last week, in my previous lecture, I mentioned that there are several good contemporary scholars, people I respect, who hold that Dodwell was a sincere Christian putting forward a non-evidentialist position on religious belief, a sort of precursor of Alvin Plantinga's reformed epistemology. And you'll recall that I disputed that characterization and brought to witness the entire range of Dodwell's contemporaries, as well as the judgment of 19th century authors on the point. But that's merely an appeal to authority. So today I want to go into Dodwell's work in more detail and see if I can present you with the evidence that has persuaded me that Dodwell was not doing this in sincerity, that it was instead a pose on his part. Just to review, Dodwell was born in 1700 and died in 1784. He was a lawyer and the son of a minister. Uh, this is his only contribution to the argument. Halfway through his life, he wrote this one work and then declined, as far as we know, to write any answers to any of the responses that were written. Uh, his argument is that Christianity is not and cannot be founded on reason. Rather, it is believed on faith, quite opposed to reason in Dodwell's construction, which the Holy Spirit communicates directly to the heart of the believer, guaranteeing that he will infallibly believe the truth. So, here's what he claims to be able to show in his own words. First, that reason, or the intellectual faculty, could not possibly, both from its own nature and that of religion, be the principle intended by God to lead us into a true faith. Secondly, that it is in so, so that neither is it so, in fact, from the plain account given us of it in Holy Scripture. And thirdly, by tracing plainly from the same indisputable authority what it positively is, and by ascertaining the proper and prescribed means to come at the knowledge of divine truths. The first claim is the most important claim. It's not only the one he leads with, it's the one he comes back to at the end. So that's the one we really need to focus on. Here's what he has to say about the incapacity of reason and the preferability of a direct inspiration. What a desirable estate such a heavenly principle might produce amongst us if permitted duly to engross our attention, we may in part be able to conjecture from the effect which in our daily notice results from an inferior restraint of the kind wherever reasoning is watchfully and effectually suppressed even by the civil authority. We see none of those unhappy divisions and hateful animosities which arise only from a fatal and ill-judged indulgence to that restless spirit of contradiction and confusion. So if only we would acquiesce in the separation of faith and reason, depend wholly upon immediate inspiration, decline to enter into any speculative discussions or examinations of manuscripts or any of that other tedium which you'll recall already in Herbert and Blount was being placed beyond the reach, perhaps of all of us, certainly of the common run of Christians, then we would find that we had no unhappy divisions and hateful animosities. All disagreements would fade away. And we can get a taste of this by seeing what happens when the civil authorities suppress the use of reason. Does that sound like a statement by someone who is sincerely advocating the suppression of reason? Or does it sound like an arch little jibe? Perhaps uh, some of you who have undertaken to read some of Barclay's Alcafron will recognize some of the characters from that in this kind of language, this kind of use of language, which has one meaning on its face and another just below the surface. Philip Doddridge, a uh, 
dissenting minister and the author of many classic hymns. If you are a student of Eng the English hymn book, you'll find that there are quite a number of hymns by Doddridge that are very well beloved. Um, wrote a book called The Perspicuity and Solidity of Those Evidences of Christianity to which the generality of its professors among us may attain. And in that, he offers the following rejoinder to what Dodwell has said. The agency of the divine spirit in promoting the reception and efficacy of the gospel, according to you, is nothing less than such an immediate and instantaneous communication of the gospel as renders every particular believer more infallible than the Church of Rome has generally represented the Pope to be, and secures the most illiterate person even from a possibility of error. This plenary inspiration communicated to every private Christian you represent as the main and only support of religion, though I think, sir, you must needs know, that every difference of opinion in the Christian Church is a demonstration that no such universal influences do, in fact, take place, so that upon the whole you have left Christianity no evidence but what everyone sees it has not. That is, indeed, you have left it no evidence at all. The page references there, pages 89 and 90, are page references to the first edition of Dodwell. So Doddridge is interacting with that edition. This is from pages 6 and 7 of Doddridge's book, cited at the bottom. But he goes on to argue for his first claim, not only positively but negatively, and negatively he takes a swipe at the Boyle Lectures. The Boyle Lectures, you'll remember, were set up by the eminent scientist Robert Boyle, who was a very sincere Christian, as a means of promoting and defending Christianity from its adversaries. Boyle stipulated that they were to defend Christianity, but to descend no lower than that. So Boyle did not want to fund a lecture series for setting Protestants against Catholics and Catholics against Protestants. He was himself a member of the Church of England, but his intention was to defend Christianity in the broad against the assail assailants that it faced even in his own day and against assaults that would come later in time. Well, here's what Dodwell says regarding the Boyle Lectures. The attempt to de defend Christianity by reason is more radically injurious to the cause of piety and more fatally instrumental in the unhinging of all religious principles than any that the art or malice of religion's worst enemies could ever have devised. A strong instance of that irreconcilable repugnance in their natures betwixt reason and belief, of which we were before speaking. Dodwell uses the word belief in some places interchangeably with the word faith. So we have here an early articulation of an absolute irreconcilability between faith and reason. Again, some of you may be thinking forward to the 19th century and thinking of someone like Kierkegaard, who I think cannot really be properly understood unless you see him as reacting to a very specific thing in his historical situation, namely the attempt to marshal the dialectics of Hegel in favor, favor of a kind of a speculative uh, theism. But, be that as it may, uh, Dodwell is articulating the opposition here it does not take a great deal of perspicuity to see that he's winking at his reader and that what he really intends is to say, see, if you want to be on the side of reason, you can't have faith. Here's Dodwell on miracles, a rather long quotation spanning two slides. Indeed, so far from any view of the kind or with any tendency toward reclaiming men's minds to a proper sense and reverence for the actor do all these extraordinary essays seem directed, so far from having any the least connection with the thought of procuring disciples from the influence of the spectacle, that a certain degree, and that no ordinary one, of previous confidence and persuasion appears to have been constantly stipulated for beforehand, to entitle them to have their applications at all listened to or regarded, and to be the sole measure and rule of dispensing these occasional favors. He's talking, of course, about the miracles of Jesus as recorded in the Gospels. And what he is saying is that Jesus would not work miracles unless people would profess that they already had faith that he would work them. In other words, he worked miracles only for a credulous audience. Dodwell goes on. Wherever we find them conferred, it was 
Still, first perceiving that the patient had faith to be healed, wherever there was the least room to distrust such a preparatory provision, he, that is Jesus, seems to capitulate and guard with especial care that a miracle should not be even accidentally a means of conversion by dismissing the petitioner with a conditional remedy, which was to take effect only in proportion to his present qualification of the kind, and of which his success was to be the sure test. According to your faith, be it unto you, were the terms. As elsewhere, he attributes professedly the whole efficacy of a miracle that had taken place to that single preliminary, thy faith, that of which I found thee already possessed, hath made thee whole. What is the point that he's trying to make here? What he's insinuating is that when he even professed to be working miracles, Jesus always hedged his bets, gave himself a way bet to back out of it if the miracle didn't take place, right? According to your faith be it unto you, he takes as a qualification an opportunity for Jesus to say later, if the miracle turned out not to have been performed, oh, well, I told him it would be done unto him according to his faith. I guess he didn't have enough faith. Now, this is a pretty bad attempt to interpret the scripture in question. But it has a certain amount of plausibility when Dodwell is able to pluck out a phrase like that in English and drop it into the flow of his own argument. Here's how John Leland responded to that particular line of argument. It is so far from being true that this was constantly the case that there are comparatively but a very few instances in which Jesus previously required persons to profess their belief in him. In one of the answers to this pamphlet, there are nearly 50 instances produced of miracles wrought by our Savior where no such things, things was required. This is uh, from letter 11, page 126. This is the part that I've been having you read. George Benson's Reasonableness of the Christian Religion is the work he's referring to, and there are eight pages of lists of passages where Jesus works miracles, and there's nothing like Dodwell is pretending to anywhere in them. But Dodwell is not done. He has a deflationary argument against the efficacy of reported miracles, miracles which we don't see worked before our own eyes. He's denied that even then they were intended to be persuasive, and he's broadly hinted that Jesus was actually insincere and looking for ways to cut his losses if the miracle didn't happen. But now, arguing upon a supposition that he's only granting arguendo, arguing upon the supposition that they were intended to produce belief, he says they're still of no use to us. If miracles were necessary in the infancy of the gospel, they are so still, and will be to the end of the world. Wherever they cease, the authority of the evidence which depended on them ceases with them. That divine demonstration to bystanders, the voice of God himself, this is my beloved son, has been by one intervening age dwindled long since to human tradition. God no longer bears witness to his son, but men only bear witness to God. The date will quite change the property of, that, of the evidence and really make all this difference. We hear no more that awful sound, but by repetition and echo. And all that commanding force of the great original attestation and acknowledgement is sunk with us into the uncertain assertions of fallible men relating it after one another. For a miracle that was ocular proof to its contemporaries, to us is no more than uncertain hearsay. You can imagine how that was received by the sincere Christians of Dodwell's own time. Uncertain hearsay is all that he is willing to grant it. It's human tradition. God no longer bears witness to his son, but men, men only bear witness to God. This passage resonates with a passage in a work by Rousseau. His uh, Savoyard vicar complains that he wants to hear the evidence of God. He wants to hear the voice of God. He wants to see the miracles. But he's told, no, you can't see them. Other people saw them. Well, then, how am I to know this? Well, men wrote them down. And how am I to know whether they wrote the truth? Well, we tell you that they told the truth. 
And the, the Savoyard vicar complains, what? Why is it always men, always men between me and God? I do not know whether Rousseau had read or was influenced by Dodwell, but there is certainly a matching pattern between what Dodwell says in this passage and the complaint that Rousseau writes out. Rousseau's work lies beyond the scope of the courses we're doing it right now, but it is an interesting work, and if any of you need further references, just ask me and I'll give them to you. What does Dodwell propose to put in the place of reason and scripture? Well, he thinks direct divine illumination, which brings home these things to the heart of every believer, is the biblical way and the only way, or at least that's what he pretends to believe. And he says, for the utter exclusion of all future encroachments of the kind, our faithful monitor and guardian, this is the Holy Spirit, has promised to continue this office and abide with us himself as long as our faith is expected to last, to the end of the world that we might not be left liable one moment to a possibility of error and imposition, which must unavoidably be the case if we were ever left to take any the least part of our instructions from one another. Taking our instructions from one another would, of course, include receiving scripture on the basis of a historical transmission of a document. Now, what a very different prospect is this and ground of security from the empty notion of mere manuscript authorities and paper revelations. Composed thus of perishable materials, the original itself, though penned like that on Mount Sinai by the very finger of God himself and engraven on adamant instead of marble, must in time come to want repairs. As for the present, it would be it would necessarily require to be multiplied by transcriptions for immediate communication. The very first step, therefore, from this genuine palladium into a copy and representation at second hand will, like the tradition of a miracle, detract in a great degree from its divine authority. And this must necessarily be the work of man, and liable, of course, from a thousand causes to fall short and deviate from its great exemplar. Even if God, by a direct miracle, were to superintend the creation and preservation of his revelation, we would need copies of it in order to be assured of what it says, and those copies would be made by men, and men are fallible, and thus the whole thing falls off from that level of certainty that we should require. Scripture, Dodwell repeatedly and extensively represents as a very insufficient guide. Here's more. So far from resting the terms of our salvation upon a writing that must run the common hazards of all other memorials of the kind, that even though a constant miracle were to interpose upon the occasion to exempt this important charge, in particular from all these changes and chances incident to all other compositions, Though the same almighty power that first indicted were to continue hovering perpetually with a guardian hand over the sacred depositum, and the constant inspection of an immediate providence concerned to revise and keep it up in all its original purity with all the, these especial privileges supposed, it were still absolutely defective and insufficient for any such revealing purpose as they would expect." the plainest terms and the plainest characters that could possibly be devised, and who will say that this is our present case with regard to the scriptures, were, at best, but the putting a dead letter into our hands without the additional grace of this active interpreter to attend it. So even if we had the original text, and who knows, still, without the Holy Spirit to interpret it for us, we would be lost that the proofs of every necessary article are certainly there to be traced is not circumstance sufficient, if anything be left in the meantime, to the skill of the workman. The trial of the witnesses, for instance, is without a doubt a very noble and convincing demonstration as it is managed of that important point of our Lord's resurrection, I say, as it stands now collected and reduced by that able hand to complete mood and figure for our ready observation. The words mood and figure here refer to components of Aristotelian logic. So he's saying this whole thing has been reduced to a syllogism. 
reduced to a proof. But the extracting and ranging it thus advantageously is by no means the province of all those whom that lesson may concern, and who would have been but very ill provided with a proper representation of that matter if they had known no other means of conducting that argument through all its connections in its fullest force, if they had been conscious of no nearer and more opportune recourse the while for their satisfaction, long before ever this voluntary apostle was pleased to engage their assistance and arose a master in Israel. In other words, even if we grant, which I think he's being sarcastic about, the adequacy of Sherlock's defense of the resurrection, still, what of those who have never read Sherlock's work, what of those who lived before Sherlock wrote, what were they supposed to be depending on? Ah, you see, says Dodwell, they would have had to fall back upon the immediate inspiration of the Spirit. The italicization of the final phrase in this quotation, from page 62, is Dodwell's own. And I want to draw your attention to this, and I'll illustrate it further with some even clearer examples. He's making an allusion to Scripture. And the passage to which he is here alluding is the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 10, where Jesus rebukes Nicodemus by saying, Are you a master of Israel and know not these things? That's the only place that phrase appears in all of Scripture. And, of course, what Jesus is rebuking Nicodemus for is not understanding how to be saved. And so under the cover of apparently praising Sherlock, Dodwell is insinuating that actually this voluntary apostle, of course, how are the apostles uh, chosen? They're chosen by God. They're sent by Jesus in the Great Commission in Matthew 28. Um, they're not voluntary apostles. They're chosen and sent. That's what the word apostello means. I send. And so by calling him a voluntary apostle, he's giving him a backhanded compliment, and then by uh, referring to him as one who arose a master in Israel, he's comparing him to Nicodemus, who with that very phrase is rebuked by Jesus. So it's not the compliment that it appears to be. Let's have a look at Dodwell's treatment of Scripture. Here, I think, most clearly, for those who can't see it already, we find the evidence that Dodwell is not a sincere religious believer, that instead he is an enemy of Christianity who is using this disguise as a means of mocking Christians. Again, there are good people whose work I respect, William Lane Craig and Keith Yandel among them, who think Dodwell is absolutely sincere in this. So all I can do is to present you with the evidence. Here is an example from page 84. Nothing, perhaps, has ever more fatally betrayed the cause of religion than the not sufficient attending to this one plain and important truth by which her champions have been sometimes inadvertently led to mistake both their weapons and their ground, to forego their advantage of an eminence and the hill country, and prepare a defense for her upon the level of which she is no way capable. The hill country. Why does he italicize that phrase? To what is he referring? He doesn't tell us. I think it's probable that he's referring to Judges 119. And the Lord was with Judah, and he took possession of the hill country. But he could not drive out the inhabitants of the plain, because they had chariots of iron. Those of you who keep in touch with contemporary internet atheism may be familiar with the popular use of the phrase iron chariots in order to uh, characterize a certain kind of self-described infidel. Is that a clear case? I think it's marginal. I suspect that he does mean Judges 119. I can't imagine what else the phrase hill country could refer to. And I think the context of it makes it plain that he is again winking at the reader who has ears to hear and eyes to see, and will understand that he's not sincere in this. But let's look at some even clearer examples. If once you allow yourself in doubting, I will take upon me to answer for the consequence that you will never well, you never will well believe if once you come fairly to your proposed situation for 
proving all things, be assured that you will never hold fast anything. He italicizes these words. Where do they come from? They come from Paul's injunction in 1 Thessalonians, which is imperative. Proof, that is, test, dokamatata, all things, hold fast that which is good. I don't think it's possible to read what Dodwell is saying here as anything other than a deliberate inversion of Paul's injunction, a deliberate repudiation of what Paul is saying, and I will just leave it to you to decide whether that's a repudiation that could be carried out in good faith by a sincere Christian. Let's do another one. For the same reason only it was, and for a proper punishment upon the incredulous and stiff-necked Jews, that he was, that is, Jesus was, so particularly cautious of exposing his person after his resurrection to public view, when his taking one turn in the marketplace might have spared both the painful labors and lives of so many holy vouchers who perished merely by the things being done in a corner. Now this is, of course, Wollstone's complaint from his sixth discourse where he says that Jesus should have showed himself to the chief priests, said to the Jewish people, and that had he done this, that would have been a far better method of demonstrating his resurrection than sending out these people to be witnesses after the fact. Now, I think Zachary Pierce gave an absolutely adequate answer to this objection, but note the way Dodwell chooses to wind it up by the things being done in a corner. To what is that a reference? It's a reference to St. Paul's statement, before Festus and Agrippa in Acts 26, 26. For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly, for I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. I admit I am perplexed how someone who is normally as perspicacious as William Lane Craig can have read Dodwell and missed these kinds of deliberate inversions of and mockings of passages of Scripture, and can think that Dodwell was a sincere devotee of a non-evidentialist religious epistemology. I just do not understand that. But you may form your own judgment on the matter. I'm going to repeat what I said at the end of the last lecture. Now, with some further passages of Dodwell fresh in your minds, perhaps you'll see it even more vividly. Here's David Hume from the end of the second part of his essay of Miracles. I am the better pleased with the method of reasoning here delivered, as I think it may serve to confound those dangerous friends or disguised enemies to the Christian religion who have undertaken to defend it by the principles of human reason. Our most holy religion is founded on faith, not on reason, and it is a sure method of exposing it to put it to such a trial as it is by no means fitted to endure. And then, from the very final paragraph, so that upon the whole we may conclude that the Christian religion not only was at first attended with miracles, but even at this day cannot be believed by any reasonable person without one. Mere reason is insufficient to convince us of its veracity, and whoever is moved by faith to assent to it is conscious of a continued miracle in his own person which subverts all the principles of his understanding and gives him a determination to believe what is most contrary to custom and experience. So to sum it up, in my judgment, Dodwell was not a sincere Christian with a non-evidentialist theory of religious belief. He was an enemy who chose this ironic persona to mock Christian belief. His method of quoting scripture often betrays his sarcastic intentions. He draws on the arguments of previous deists and attempts to set Protestants and Catholics at odds with one another. If you read further, in Dodwell, you'll find that repeatedly he's attempting to stir up these debates between Protestants and Catholics, which is an old trick of the deists, of course. Um, and it is plausible, though not certain, that he was an influence on David Hume. That is where I am going to terminate today's lecture.